Hi, I'm Owen from REST Australia. Thanks for tuning in to the REST Network. Before we get into today's show, there are a few things we have to go over. Firstly, what you're about to hear and see is limited to general information only. It's not personal financial advice like you'd get from a financial planner. Also, it's important to remember that past performance is not indicative of future performance. That means that anything that's happened in the past, or we say today, is not necessarily going to reflect what happens in the future. Lastly, please consider that any of the guests or myself are featuring on this program may have a financial interest in some of the products or shares mentioned. That's enough from me. I hope you enjoyed today's program. Megan, thank you for taking some time to join me on the podcast today. I really appreciate it. Thanks very much, Owen. Thanks for having me. And, and you too, Jeremy. I know um, you look like you're somewhere warm, but thank you for taking the time to, <laughs> to join both Megan and I and have this chat. Delighted to be here. Today, we're going to be talking about um, biotechnology. We're going to be talking about companies and in particular with you, Megan, how you've scaled a business and how you uh, have grown the business so successfully. And Jeremy, you and I and Megan will be talking about investing. So taking like the other side of the table, what you look for and how you go about doing what you've done for so many years successfully. But maybe just to, to kick things off, I'll start with you, Jeremy. Uh, can this is perception in investing that biotechs are inherently very risky, right? And a lot of people approach it as this more speculation than investing. At least that's what a lot of people think. And then you stumble across like a website like yours or a business like yours, and you see um, in a group of investors that have been doing it so successfully for so long. So can you maybe, um, as succinctly as you can, because I'm sure there's so much we could pack into it, can you maybe give us a few pointers on where many investors tend to go wrong? Yeah, and I'd be happy to do that. Um, I suppose I look at my life as an investor as managing the unknowns and ensuring that those unknowns become known. And that sounds like one of those strange <laughs> American politician statements. Um, but the reality is everything starts as an aspiration. So somebody has an idea and they want to take that idea forward. And probably, from my perception, they have little understanding of the challenges of doing that. And my job, therefore, is to help the founding aspirationalist to think through those aspirations in the context of what does this really mean? So you've got an idea, you want to take it forward, and you're then going to be faced with the simplest of things like how do you make whatever the product is that you want to develop? Not trivial. How do you address the regulatory authorities? Not trivial. All those sorts of things which actually aren't necessarily well understood by the originating thought. And the consequence of that is that there appears to be a high risk in that journey. But in reality, the, the risk is understanding what you have to do and being prepared for it. So if it comes to manufacturing, don't leave it to the last moment as a, an issue to address. Make sure that you've thought about it early, because if there are complications, you want to either get them out of the way or forget your dream and go home. <laughs> if there are issues with the regulator, Think about what you're going to do with those issues. How are you going to address the regulator? And then work with people who can help. So I suppose my message is people like us have spent 40 years working our way through avoiding mistakes. If you want to make investments in the sector, try to link up with people like us because that way, as a journey together, we can actually do these things correctly. Mm. It's funding that's required and it's experience that's required and that's what i hope that we sort of bring to the party mm. I, I might just stick with you just for a moment jeremy is there anything that if you were being pitched an idea or like a company or something like that is there anything that uh, and megan can get the inside scoop here is there anything that <laughs> a management team might um do to throw you off as in are there instances where there's some things you just think that hasn't been thought through properly or something like, is there any telltale signs there? Ultimately, Owen, we're always backing people. And so it's the way that the people present, which is crucial. We know that the science is going to be either okay or not. And that's one can sort out by getting other people to, to comment, but it really does come to those down to those people. So the overconfidence is the, the, the challenge. <laughs> Somebody who doesn't look like they're going to be listening. As I said, it's the guys that stop listening when we give them the check. <laughs> yeah. 
That's not a good experience to have if you happen to be the check giver. So you're looking for you're looking for a relationship with those who are going to be relied on to build a business, and that relationship has to has to stand the test of time. I mean, everybody will tell you it takes 15 years to go from zero in the lab bench through to the marketplace. That's a long relationship. And even if we're not there the whole time, we've got to be comfortable that that relationship works in a two-way street sense and that we have confidence and they have confidence in us. That collaboration is critical. Mm. Megan, um, a lot of our listeners probably don't come from a medical background uh, like you do, or they probably don't understand the research process, which uh, Jeremy just alluded to. Can you give us a sense of basically what's involved at each of the, the stages of trial? And maybe you can kind of weave in your experience running the business through that period and um, maybe use examples of what might be included at each at each stage? Yeah, and I think it's... Um at times for the investment community, it's it's one of those things that um, needs to be very well understood. And I completely agree with Jeremy. Sometimes it's it's all about the questions, knowing what questions to ask, not necessarily knowing all the answers, but knowing where to find the answers. And I think um, that, that layers into just the general understanding of biotech. And I think fundamental of biotech is the clinical trial process, as you say. Um, and it is surprising, actually, because it's something that we think about every day of, of every every minute of every day, you know, when we're developing a drug. Um, but there is a little bit of a misunderstanding that all clinical trials are created equal, um, but they're fundamentally different. And, and how you can interpret the data and the quality of the data really does come down to the stage of the development process that the company is, is in. And also the nuances of how the trials are designed and what information you can actually uh, glean from the, the various studies that are going on. And it varies widely from company to company. So I would urge investors to actually take a really good look at the quality of the trial design and, and, and take the time to understand the differences in the process. When it comes to clinical trials, there are really broadly speaking, there's three phases of clinical development. There's the first phase, which is phase one, subsequently phase two, and then finally phase three. And that's broadly speaking. There's various other cuts and divisions of that, but phase one, phase two, and phase three. And phase one is the earliest stage. Um, the size and the scope of those trials is usually quite small or quite limited. Mm -hmm. um, it's typically when the, uh, the drug goes into a patient for the first time. Um, and so the primary objective of a phase one clinical study is usually to investigate the safety and toler tolerability of the, of the therapy. Obviously, regulators around the world do not want to see you putting a drug into a patient and for there to be something unexpected when it comes to safety of the, of the trial, so of the, of the drug. So the phase one is really there to establish that you can put the drug into the patient. There's nothing unexpected going on. And consequently, those um, studies usually start at a low dose and then they escalate up through higher doses. And sometimes they get to the maximum tolerated dose so you know how high you can go without, um, without um, causing too many side effects. And so you get a lot of information on the safety of, of, of the drug. Um, and that's really important. That is not to be underestimated. If, if a trial is designed well or it's possible, it's not always possible, in the first phase, you might also get some indication of how well the drug works, but it's usually just an indication of how it works. Okay, okay. Um, if, you, if you move forward, then having established the safety tolerability of phase one, you move into phase two. That's the second phase of the trial. And the objective typically is a little bit different. It's about showing evidence that your drug might have activity, might be working to Im impact the disease um, in, in the patient. Um, the trials are typically a little bit bigger, but I would caution that not all phase twos are created equally. Um, some phase twos are quite small. Some of them are uncontrolled, i.e. they don't have a control arm that you can statistically compare to the, 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 the test agent that you're, that you're investigating. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you have fully randomised, controlled, quite large clinical studies that are really proof of concept that in many ways are just a slightly smaller version of what you'll go on to do in phase three. Um, and, and, and it's fair to say that I think sometimes phase twos, even if they're small, are positioned a little bit um, uh, 
perhaps inappropriately that they're going to, you know, give give all of the answers and, and that's going to be the, the end of the game. We're going to know everything. A phase two is there to get demonstrate activity. It is there to inform your phase three and to show that you have a drug that really does have signals of, uh, of, of promise to be of benefit to the patient. But it vastly uh, varies as to how much information you get from those phase two, depending on how they're designed. Um, I think the best thing you can do in phase two is get as much out of that possible study as you can because phase threes are very expensive typically and you want to go into the phase three with the best possible design that you can because that's when you're in phase three, that's the data package that you need to submit to your regulators so that you can get approval of your drug and, of course, then you can start selling the drug and giving it to patients um, in the various regions and hopefully globally. Um, but phase threes are typically designed with regulators' requirements in mind. Um, they're large studies. They have to be statistically powered um, to show a, a, a difference between your drug and the placebo or the standard of care. Um, and, and it's very regimented as to how you need to do those studies. Um, but they are the, the final stage before you can actually get the drug approved. So I think diving into understanding whether or not the, the trials have the right endpoints. Um, are they the endpoints that the regulators want to see to give the drug um, the tick of approval for you to go onto the market? What is the data that supported um, moving into phase three in, in the first place? Was it a, the same endpoint that is then going to be used in phase three? You want to typically see a lot of consistency or at least the learnings from phase two be applied into phase three because to Jeremy's point, it's all about de-risking your investment. It's about going in with your eyes open and saying, okay, this company's done it the same way. We have, we know that this drug impacted that particular outcome and they're doing the same outcome in their phase three. That gives me a level of confidence. Or the mm -hmm. company identified an issue with this particular outcome. They're then excluding those particular patients, for example, and that's going to then concentrate um, or, or produce a subgroup that's then going to have a higher chance of success. It's actually teasing out the data in that way that I think can inform you as to what is a really well-designed phase three, phase two, or indeed a phase one that then can guide your investment process as well. Uh, it would seem to me that the, the rigour that applies maybe at stage two then could give investors an, a better line of sight through to stage three. Would Absolutely. That be if a phase three, if a phase two is very well done, and um, you know we, we did a very large phase three, phase two, we did a, a, a large study that it really is one of the largest in um, our eye disease that we were studying in, um, and we we statistically powered it so that we we have a high level of confidence that the effect that we've seen is that we have seen is real, um, and then that then informs us as to what endpoint we'll use in the phase three, how we'll statistically power it, what kind of benefit we might be expecting. And all of that guides how you then design your clinical trials down the line. If you do too small of a study in your phase two, often companies might then say, I, I'm going to do a larger phase two because I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't know enough about how my drug's working to justify the expense and the time that it will take to do a fully um, a full pivotal program, which is required to submit to regulators to get the drug approved. So it's the nuance, it's the size of the trial, it's how well it's powered statistically, it's the information and, and its relevance for approval. All of those things are the conversations I think that you have, that people like Jeremy have with, with companies to get the level of confidence that this is a company that one knows what they're doing, the trial is designed in the right way, and if I invest my money in it, it will be sufficient Pending, pending the data, pending the outcomes, but if it's that they're doing it the right way, and then the only the only real question you want is, well, does the drug work? Not did they do it correctly? Yeah, um, that's can abs you absolutely a critical point. If I could just pick up on that, um, disasters in my world are usually when something was done to a budget rather than to the requirement of the regulator. Okay. Um, and that just reflects the world that we have to live in, that Megan lives in, and that is that the funding for what we're doing tends to be provided in stages. And the stages often relate to achieving something. So there's a milestone, there's a completion of phase one, there's a completion of phase two. 
the drug companies don't have to have that same approach because they tend to have a much larger bank balance supporting them, and therefore they can sometimes take their time. Doesn't mean to say they do it any better, but at least the mistakes can be covered off by drawing down some more money from the, the bank account at the back. Mm. Our challenge always is to work within the funding that is available to us and the objectives that we have to meet. And the, and the standard of care that we have to also meet in order to get our way through this, this regulatory process, which adds, adds another complexion to the job that Megan has to do, which doesn't necessarily appear in the same way in, in Pfizer or GSK. Mm. Mm. Um, Megan, maybe this is a good chance to segue into what it is that you're working on. And one of the things that we as an investment community tend to look for is, you know, the addressable market, the opportunity for this. And I think having, you know, looked at the business and what you're working on, it's clear that like for a lot of invest, a lot of investors could envisage this being a really important thing. Obviously all trials are important, but they can grasp the idea and the opportunity pretty quickly. So maybe if you can talk to that a little bit and, and what you're working on specifically, um, I think that'll add a lot of context. Sure. So what at Optia, we, have a therapy, which is an injection into the eye, which is um, the standard route of administration, the standard mode of treatment for the treatment of wet age-related macular degeneration or wet AMD. Um, you may have heard of it. It's a very prevalent disease. It typically affects people in the older age groups um, over the age of 50. Um, it's the most common form of blindness. Um, it affects the back of the eye um, and it is a highly prevalent disease. The existing treatments for the disease are relatively limited. Um, they work to an extent in patients, but there's a very high unmet medical need in the sense that patients might have an initial response to those treatments, um, but over time their vision starts to decline and currently there's no other options for physicians to actually give them another another therapy to, you know, to turn that, that chronic decline around. Um, but also, even with the standard of cares that are available right now for wet AMD, most patients actually still have further room for improvement. So they may see a stabilisation of their vision, um, but their vision is still um, less than optimal. They may not have restored vision that allows them to recognise faces or read or live independently or drive a car, for example. And so there's a need for new treatments and that's where our therapy at Opthea comes in. We have a, a treatment that's quite different to all of the standard of care therapies. It works through the same pathway, but it actually, when it's used together with the standard of care, it results in a much broader blockade mm -hmm. of, of the disease. And um, we've shown in a very large phase two in a statistically powered study that when we add our drug on top of standard of care, that patients actually could see better. Um, and, and that was very important because we're, the, we're effectively the most advanced product in development, targeting a new mechanism that may offer patients the ability to actually see better and have better vision outcomes. So that's why we're very, very excited about it. And we're playing in a landscape, frankly, where most companies are just developing another form of standard of care that, um, that, that might offer some dosing advantages, for example. We're really looking to address clinical efficacy and, and vision improvement. Mm. Uh, so when we, when we hear this from across the table, Jeremy, I know you obviously have involvement with Avita, and for those who don't know about the business too intimately, they might be familiar with spray on skin, you know, that, that catchphrase, mm -hmm. it's like spray on skin, because it was... I guess it was developed by Fiona Wood in, in 2002 and it was used to treat barley bombing victims. Um, and, you know, the, the business took until 2018, that's what I've got in my notes, uh, to, to finally get approved through the FDA and, and to treat burns. And there's still, you know, there's some other things going on at the moment. Um, mm. That You said before 15 years to go through, you know, something that seemed to have worked all the way back then until 2018. Is that normal? Can you talk us through that, that pathway? Vita is a very unusual story because the, the innovation was made by a plastic surgeon, Fiona, mm. who was suddenly faced with the opportunity of, of testing out her, her innovation on real people, on patients. And so the barley bombing, provided those patients and they provided the opportunity for the, the technology to be tested. 
What it unfortunately also did was to side jump away from the regulatory pathway. So when we came to the company, it had this wonderful database of all the people who had been treated, but none of it had ever been done in a regulated way. That there was no regulatory pathway that was followed. And so I was looking at 5,000 individual cases, all of which looked positive. And you think, well, there's got to be a market here. And to Sir Megan's point, there's no question about the market opportunity. But the question, therefore, is how does one present this to the regulator? How does one get this approved by the regulator? And the question that we never answered properly until later was how do we actually get surgeons to use the product? (laughs) Mm. So both of those had to be solved. But fortunately, we started with the regulator piece and we rebuilt the company from coming in as investors to visit the FDA, talk to them, that that's the US regulator, talk to them about what had been done so far, persuade them that there was a route forward that avoided having to do phase one trials because in essence, 5,000 demonstrations had got us through that. We were able to move to swiftly to a phase two trial and a phase three trial and got the product approved. Now, I always think of FDA approvals of products as a little bit like a hunting license. You can now go into the jungle, but you better be prepared for what the jungle is going to throw at you or whether mm. there's going to be lions and tigers chasing you. And what was completely missed, and we fortunately trapped it in time, was that the the marketplace is dominated by surgeons who are going to apply this product. And they've all read the book about doing full thickness skin grafts. Mm. That's how they've been trained. And we come along and say, don't do that, do this, which looks radically different. As you might imagine, most surgeons said, show me on somebody else. Mm. (laughs) So the whole process had not been thought through in terms of training surgeons, in terms of building key opinion leaders to support the use of the product. And finally, with all of that behind us and a whole series of training regimes and videotapes and everything else, we got the product onto the market. And from that point on, it was successful. But it was a very good example of if you dodge the regulator in the first place, you're never going to get an approval. Mm. If you get an approval, think about the marketplace and how you're going to address it, and then recognize that that, that's going to require effort and investment dollars. And you have better be straight with your investors about that, Mm. who have thought that you just had a cure for treating burns 10 years earlier. Mm. 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 Megan, maybe I'll turn that straight over to you then. If, Mm. if, if, the process, and this we uh, we had this pre prepared in the, the talking points, but if the process is so long, you've done a really good job of keeping investors engaged for quite a long time and growing the business. But then to Jeremy's points there about commercialization, making sure the end user has something that they can use and they're accepting it. Can you talk us through that as well? So you've got the keeping investors engaged, but also how do you solve the problem at the like on the ground? Yeah, and, and the fundamental challenges in having a, um, a drug development program, I think sometimes it's underestimated. The, it, there is just, it, it just takes time and it takes, it, it should take time because the regul, if you're doing it by the regulatory standards to their, to their requirements, you're just going to have to do what they want and how they want you to do it. And deviating too far from that path is only going to put the program at risk. Mm. Um, and so it's almost a little bit, it, it is actually like kind of battening down the hatches, getting the energy up. Okay, now we're going to do our phase three. We're going to have to get the right investors on board. These investors are going to need to understand. We don't want to cut corners. To Jeremy's point, cutting corners is a recipe for disaster. You're going to throw good money at, at, at something that is fundamentally going to be at risk for approval. So you don't want to do that. So it's about engaging with the investors, I think, and informing them, bringing them into the, the knowledge base that you have and saying, look, we have faith and conviction in this drug for this reason, not because of my emotion, but because the data tells us that this really does have promise. I can't promise you it's going to work, but all of the data 
gives us the conviction and there's good rationale. And if you get them on board and you are very open with, I think, the path and the journey that you're on, the right investors will come on, come in and they will support you along that drug development path. And we've had we've been very fortunate. We've had a lot of long-term institutional investors that have come with us and supported us through our early clinical trials, been excited about the data, reinvested their hard-earned investment dollars into our company and then have also supported us now into phase three. And they're there for the long, the long term in order to see this become a successful drug. But I think it's about being honest about what it's going to take that in many in many cases there's a little bit, it's a quiet period where the company is running as fast as they can to get the trial done but there's not a lot of news flow but it's understanding that the payoff for that is, is, is massive. Now, in the background, the other important thing is for the company to both of your points, which is it's not... It's not just about doing the right study. There are plenty of um, companies that do the right study, but actually it's the wrong mode of administration or, as, as, as Jeremy said, you've got, you've got to be disruptive. You have to get the mind share of the physician. The physicians need to come along with you as well and they need to say, okay, if this is a drug that is approved and I believe in your science and think it will be approved, will I use it? And you have to do some work there. And it does take investment dollars to get the mind share of the physician to actually understand if you're positioning the drug right. Is it the right um, mode of administration? Is, 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 is it easily accessible and easy for the physician to administer? Because sometimes it's the most simplest of things that actually mm-hmm. mean that you've got a great drug, but it won't be used. So you've got to do that work early. You have to invest in that. And um, I think you're you're in a better position if actually the market understands that you're doing the work to actually ensure that you're going to get a good launch, a good launch of your product. It's going to be taken up and adopted very, very quickly by the physicians and the patients are going to be on board um, because all of those pieces have to be in place to have a successful drug. Mm. Jeremy, uh, how would the... So we've got some fantastic companies here in Australia. Um and across the pond as well and with our friends in New Zealand. How do you think that compares to, you know, all of the, the geographies around the world, uh, massive biotechnology companies overseas? How, how do you see that? And I, I guess I've got a follow up question about, you know, private equity involvement in this space. But I guess just generally speaking, how do you see the landscape for companies? We started to build our investment business back in the late 80s in Australia because we could see innovation coming through much more strongly than in many other countries. And so that's what we're looking for. That's what we were looking for. But it is in an environment that naturally has a degree of higher complexity to bring that innovation through to a marketplace. Mm. The great advantage of the US is that you've got 250 million people who can be tested on. (laughs) (laughs) And and you've got a demand that is definable in millions rather than tens of thousands. So the approach from Australia has to take that into account. So we see the innovation. That's why we started the business back in in, in 89, uh, I think our first in investment was a, um, was a treatment for um, HIV. And then we've, we've stuck with it, but recognizing that we can build things to a point in Australia where they are ready for prime time, but ultimately, though, that prime time has to be prepared. So we have a, a business at the moment called Saluda Medical, which has been developing a treatment for chronic back pain. Most of the technology development has happened in Australia. But the reality is the marketplace sits in the United States. The marketplace sits in Europe. And we've now got to build the company out to match where the market is. And that becomes the challenge. And it's getting investors to recognize that it's not an overnight success. These things do have to be planned. They have to be worked for and they have to be invested in. And to Megan's point, the investors have to trust those who are running the businesses that they know what they're doing. And Megan's a classic example of she's built a reputation, she's built a position, she's built a company, and she is easy to support in that objective that she has. Most others don't have what it takes to put all of that together. And that's where investors like us 
do actually have to play quite an important role, which is sometimes to make adjustments to the companies on their road. Very rarely, of course, adjustments to technology, very often adjustments to the, the, the shape of the business, their points of focus, and the need to attract particular skill sets in at, at times where you can't just do it on an amateur basis. Mm. Do you think, Jeremy, and this was going to be my follow-up question, do you think, you know, public markets can sometimes be quite myopic, short-term focused. Do you think that private investment vehicles, uh, is there an advantage of that in a space? Um, I think once... My simple approach is to remember that whatever I am selling, i.e. investing in this sector, I have to be selling to a party that's interested. And the interest waxes and wanes. So sometimes healthcare is the place to be and sometimes it isn't. Sometimes it's success stories. People will tell you about it in the street. Sometimes they'll tell you about all the depressing things. So therefore, you've got to adjust the investment vehicles to match up with the investor's interests and what they're comfortable with. So we will look at both public market structures, which therefore allow investors to come and go through the public market, or we'll look at private equity structures where everybody's locked in for a period. For For a pension fund, Being locked in for a period is actually quite helpful because it means they don't have to worry about what to do with the money while we've got it, as long as we bring it back with a multiple attached to it. But for a a small investor or for a retail investor, they don't necessarily want to be locked in. They want to have the flexibility of, of placing their bets, placing their interests, moving with the companies and moving across the sector. So therefore, that market needs to be approached by recognizing that there needs to be liquidity for them um, Mm -hmm. in some shape or form. So it really is an exercise of of matching the current interest of the investors with the vehicles that one provides. Ultimately, it all has to be long-term money. Mm -hmm. Exactly the point that that Megan made. This takes time. It requires confident investors to support the investee companies. And in most cases, I think if, this, if the presentation is made successfully by the CEO and his or her team, the lock-in is one that the shareholders themselves desire. They don't want to be out of it when it all starts to happen. Mm, <laughs> and sure. so they will be consistent and consistent in their support. Mm. Um, Megan, on that, uh, how do you balance the trials – then it be ready for commercialization, global expansion. You know, how do you balance that? How do you scale a business like this? Um, I'm thinking people, I'm thinking resources, like partnerships. How do you think about that generally speaking? Yeah, look, I think um, you work 24 <laughs> uh, seven. So it's, it's kind of all encompassing. I think that you want people around you as well that um, I think the most important thing is that the people around you, your board, but also your management team all share this, the same vision and they're all waking up in the night thinking about what needs to be done and they're, they're living it every every day. So I think the conviction of the team and their capabilities is super important. We've um, we've we've guided the growth of the company according to the stage of of the of of the trial and what our requirements were. I'm a big believer in running things very efficiently. I think it's very hard to raise money, um, and I don't care if it's a dollar or a million dollars. If it's not the right spend of that dollar or a million dollars, regardless of the scope of the money, it's it's the wrong decision. So I think it's about careful financial management but also knowing when it's time to actually um, grow the company as well. And we made a very deliberate decision when we went into phase three that a lot of it was actually about the point that Jeremy made, which is you have to invest in the global larger market. We are very focused on Australia, but we are not going to re-enroll all the patients when that is not the real driver of the value of this product because the big markets are, uh, are the US, Europe, and you have to have uh, exposure there as well. And you also have to get the right investors at the table that are going to allow you to undertake such a big late stage clinical program. So we made the decision to actually grow, go into the US, build a team in the US. We now have more people based in the US than we do in Australia, but we're still the Australian company, but 
but we have a big team in the US. It gives us exposure to US investors. It also gives us a footprint that is recognisable globally as, as a US and Australian company. Um, and, and it's just about staging, I think, that, that growth and development, but maintaining the culture of the company, which is we're going to respect our investors' investment and we're going to put our, the money to work where it delivers outcomes for the trial but also sets us up well for launch. And I think it's just having that mindset around efficient um, capital management and and dedication to the trial um, that that guides how you grow the company. But it, 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 it is a lot of energy and it's, I think, getting people in, to embrace the, the, the time that it takes to get there as well. Mm. I might actually uh, stay with you on this because the business uh, today, is, I just checked it, is $450 million in terms of market capitalization, which is pretty incredible. Um, it's a pretty incredible feat. I guess investors looking at that and thinking, you know, stage three, um, they're thinking like, well, what are the key indicators for me? Like, what does Megan want to let me know? And sh- what should I be thinking about as I look forward? Can you give us any sort of sense of like, what are the key indicators of success going forward for you? Yes. Yeah, so, look, I think the, the, the main thing that drives me is the quality of data. Um, and you've got to keep coming back to that. And, and I think the ability of the team to execute. So, I would look at a company and I would use us as an example, but I would look at other companies as well when I'm thinking about investment and saying, well, who has executed and, and done what they said they were going to do and who's done it the right way so that they're not cutting corners and they're doing everything that is needed in order to get to the end game. And the end game is to get an approved product and to return value mm-hmm. for shareholders, absolutely. Um, and so I think it, it's being grounded in looking at the quality of the data, understanding that data, um, and, and having the confidence that the team is being built. But, for example, right now we're preparing for commercialisation. I haven't launched a drug before, but I've got people on my board that have launched a drug. I've got a chief commercial officer that has launched drugs. We've got, you know, a spectrum of vendors and, and, and consultants that have launched drugs and, and you just have to surround yourself with the right people but know when you need to do that as well. And I think that's an indicator of success. But I think the ultimate the ultimate indicator really is the confidence in the data that you've got. I just keep coming back to that. It's not about how well you've sold the data that you have. It's about the the fundamental quality. Is it relevant data? Was it large large enough trial? Was it mm. was it statistically powered? All of those things are the fundamentals that have to um, give you confidence that you're on the path in the right direction and that you're applying that moving forward. I don't know if that answers your question, but I think that's the fundamental for me that I look for um, when I when I like companies that I see. Mm. No, it does. Um- Jeremy, my, my, I, guess no, my- I was just going to, I was just going to quickly pick up on a, on a point that Megan was making. It's all about preparing for the future and recognizing that the future is usually a bigger version of the present, and therefore one has to con- continue to grow the organization and grow the infrastructure and recognize that the market itself has to be there to be grown into. And a quick comeback to the Avita story: Avita was set up to treat burns. Mm. But the Burns market was always seen to be pretty small. And as we discovered it was complicated to sell to, to, the, to the surgeons, we decided we'd focus entirely on the US. That's where we could build a business. But the reality is that that same technology can be equally well applied to soft tissue wounds, for which the market is much larger. But we had to go and get regulatory approval for that. So the, the story of Avita continues. So we've got our Burns market. We are now moving into the soft tissue wounds market and there will be others beyond that. So the company itself has to be adjusted, has to be grown in that context. And that, it, that indeed creates another um, boost to, to the whole process and the mm. whole delivery of success. Mm. I think maybe um, one thing, like through this thing called coronavirus, which is a very big issue for everyone around the world, um, the, the limelight got put straight back on biotechnology and solutions. And um, a lot of people are turning to the sector to solve problems, right? There's so many advancements going on in many different directions. And I guess, uh, Jeremy, the final question for you would be, therefore, what are, 
from where you sit, having done this for decades, what are you excited about? What are you interested in? What do you see? De- what do you see developing that, I guess, gets you out of bed every morning? And you think, wow, this is really interesting. Um, it's a very specific area that we fell into, um, which I've loosely called um, digital therapy. And in the simplest of terms, digital technology meets medicine. And the consequence of that is going to be a radical change in the practice of medicine Mm. in a way that none of us at the moment can even conceive of. But we're beginning to see the results of it. And it can be down the line consultation with your GP, or it can be something a whole lot more sophisticated, which is you know, a, a, a smart prosthetic knee that we've just been working on, which has now been launched, which allows the, the doctor to know what's going on with the patient intimately because that prosthetic knee is sending signals back saying he's standing on one leg and he's doing his exercises badly or whatever else it may be required. That, is, that technology, that digital approach is going to send or create information flows back from the patient, which we can only dream of, which will certainly impact the way in which the patients are treated. It will certainly impact the outcomes for patients. And hopefully it will also lead to prevention as much as cure, because the more we can prevent, the better off we all are. Mm. Unless you're, of course, in Megan's business, in which case you can't prevent, so you better cure. Mm. <laughs> and those, are the, those are the issues I think that I'm very excited about and the way in which this digital technology is going to impact and it's going to require a lot of training of physicians rethinking of product and rethinking of the the way in which medical medicine is practiced Mm. that's see that type of thing is um so exciting to a lot of people to hear that and um i guess this this exploration while it's been quite concise for the three of us i think it's going to help people at least understand how investing in biotechnology works and what is required um, from people like Megan uh, and her team. So I just want to thank you both. I know this wasn't easy to um, to, to find a time that worked for all of us uh, operating from everywhere, but I really appreciate the two of you being our field guide and helping me through this process as well. So Megan, firstly to you, thanks for thanks for sharing the story. I'll put links in the show notes to, to the company's website and to everything they need to know. So thank you for, thank you for joining us. Thank you. And uh, and Jeremy, uh, thank you. Uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day and uh, I really appreciate the wisdom. Thank you. Well, it's great to connect to you. Great to connect with Megan, who I haven't been able to do for about two years, all all through COVID. Good to see you. Good to see you, Jeremy. (laughs) We'll catch up soon properly. (laughs) Wonderful. We should. Thank you very much, Owen. And um, yeah, let's let's get behind Australian, Australian science. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you both.